Let me welcome everybody. Let me welcome you to this week's Future Trends Forum. I'm your host, the creator and chief cat herder for the Future Trends Forum, Brian Alexander. And I'm very glad to see all of you here today. I'm looking forward to our conversation very much. Now, before we proceed, I'd have to explain a bit about the forum, where it comes from, how it's structured, how it works, who supports it, and then I'll introduce this week's guests and this week's topic. So, to begin, uh, the Future Trends Forum is a spin-off of another project, the Future Trends and Technology and Education Report. And if you haven't seen that, that's a monthly trends analysis that tracks nearly 90 trends across education and technology. It's been doing that for about six years, developing a longitudinal database of major developments that are reshaping education and technology. If you have an FTT and you can download some sample copies and subscribe if you like. We also use the hashtag FTTE uh, to keep track of discussion on Twitter. Now that is a report. Uh, it is a publication, heavily referenced, non-interactive in the social sense. What we do is we host a widely ranging open discussion involving multiple people, dozens and hundreds of people, about these particular subjects. So the forum is kind of the discussion-oriented version of the heavy research-oriented FTD report. Now, both the report and this forum are part of a broader project called the Future of Education Observatory. If you haven't seen that, that is an open, ongoing, multimedia attempt to wrestle with the future of education. And so that includes the report, includes this forum. It also includes a blog, it includes a bookstore and a book club. And some other things, if you've seen this before, just go to futureofeducation.us and you can learn more. Now, that's the framework for this project. Let me tell you a bit about uh, who supports all of this. So uh, one source that we'd really like to thank is an old friend, Nizer. That nonprofit does terrific work in keeping that state's colleges and uh, universities on the broadband internet. They do some groundbreaking work, and we're really impressed by them, and we're really grateful to them for their support. We're also grateful to Shindig, because as you can tell, Shindig makes available the technology we're using now. So speaking of which, let me walk you through it so you can see how all this works. This is a video conference platform, and it has some features you might recognize from others, but then some that are distinct. For example, where I am right now, and where this slide is just for another minute, is called the stage. You can see everything that comes up on the stage, hence the name. And you can join us, and I'll show you how to do that in just a minute. And now, below us is what I think of as the participant swarm. So I can just mouse over, and I can see there's Jim Whitlock, there's Fred Bashirs. Uh, Marlo, there's Kim, there's all kinds of people. And if you look at them, you can see each person is represented either by a video stream or a photograph or a, a black silhouette. And if you mouse over them, you can get a little bit more information about them. And if you'd like to have a private conversation with them, no problem, just double click on them. And if they're interested in talking to you, your two icons will click together like Legos, and you can have your own private audiovisual conversation. Just like you're in a conference hall where you can put your head together next to somebody and talk to them. That's one of the ways that you can interact. But this is a discussion-based platform that I knew some of the major ways you can interact with everybody. Look down at the bottom of the screen. There's a white strip running along it with a bunch of different buttons. And I want to draw your attention to three of those. So on the leftmost edge, the first button you'll see is a number and a bunch of kind of like human silhouettes and a little dialog box. The number right now reads 59, uh, 60. If you click on that, up will pop two boxes. Box on the left is a kind of film strip view of all the participants. So you can just mouse over people and get even more information. So you can find Beth DuPont as the director of LEDS at Skidmore College. And you can find Nick Kangala as a senior technology specialist at Otterbein University and so on. Now to the right of that is a chat box. And you can just chat with all the people who have logged in with you about 20 at a time things in there. In fact, if you haven't already, take a second just to introduce yourself. Say who you are and where you're from today. I'll do it right now. I'm Brian. Coming to you from the D.C. area. So the chat box is a good place for informal kind of ideas or things they'd like to think about. They post quick reactions to things that have come up on stage. Uh, sometimes people share URLs uh, to projects or articles that have come up. So the chat box is one way to interact. 
Now, if you go back to that white strip, there are a few more buttons that are really important. Those are the question mark with a circle around it. And if you mouse over it, the word ask will come up. That's because this is a quick way for you to ask a question for everybody. So if you just click that button, you can type in a quick comment or question. And when the time is right, we're going to flash it on the screen so everyone can read it. And then I'll read it out loud so everyone can hear it. And guess. So there's the chat box, there's the ask button, but then the most powerful and fun one is right next to that. It's the button that's in the shape of a raised hand. If you click that, that tells us that you want to join us on stage. So if your video, if your microphone is working and you're in a place where you can speak out loud, uh, click that button and you can join us on stage. In fact, we can have four people appear at a time. So there's plenty of room. Uh, Uh, for you. It is just a few minutes, um, but that makes this an actual video conference. So you can click that hand, you can click the ask button, you can type in the chat box, and we've already seen a few people saying hello, people from as far apart as New York State, Minnesota, upstate New York. So those are three ways. Meanwhile, if you'd like to, if you're on Twitter, just use the hashtag FTTE, and I'll be tracking that throughout. And if you have any comments or thoughts, you can just bring them right in. So those are multiple ways of interacting on the Shindig platform. And we're really grateful to Shindig for making it available. So we're also grateful to a third population. Uh, and this is our supporters on Patreon. Uh, if you're new to Patreon, it's a crowdfunding site, kind of like GoFundMe or Kickstarter. But the idea is to crowdfund an ongoing person or project making stuff. In this case, it's a project of making stuff about the future of education and technology. So if you sign up for contributing as little as a buck a month, you can help keep the lights on, keep the machines humming, and keep these projects going. Uh, if you contribute a bit more, you get more stuff. Um, if you take a look, for example, at the slide, you can see a bunch of people who are some of our top contributors. Um, you know, wonderful folks like uh, Michael Haggins and Jeannie Kim Han and Chris Lott. And you can join them. And I put that wonderful wall of credits up everywhere I go. Uh, if you haven't seen this before, go to patreon.com slash Brian Alexander, or look at the bottom left edge of your screen. Uh, you'll see a kind of tan colored button that says support the future. Of There's about 100 people there right now. We're grateful to them for their support. So that's how the forum is supported. That's how the technology works. That's where it came from. That's how we believe in discussion. Let me now introduce this week's guests. Uh, I'm really excited that we get to address a topic that we've only touched on before in the past two and a half years. We're going to be talking about new learning spaces. Uh, and our guests are Lisa Steffens from the University of Buffalo and the SUNY system in New York, as well as Rebecca Frazzi from San Diego State University. They're the leaders of the Flex Space Project, the Flexible Learning Environments Exchange, a wonderful collaborative website for exploring and sharing information about new learning spaces. So if you're tired of old lecture halls, if you think classrooms from the 18th century shouldn't be used, you're in the right place and you have the best guides in the world for it. Welcome, friends. Welcome. Glad to be here. Thanks, Barb. Well, I'm really glad that you could make it. I'm really glad to see you. Both this triumph of technology that we get to have a conversation that right now the three of us includes California, New York, and Washington DC. Um, I can I can speak about both of you uh, for hours if if I could if I could just have you just quickly introduce yourself. Um, Re Rebecca, why don't you start off? Tell us what you do at FlexSpace and what you do. Okay, sure. Thanks, Brian. So I'm Rebecca Frazee. I am um, in San Diego. I teach uh, in the Learning Design and Technology program at San Diego State, formerly called the Educational Technology uh, mm. program. Mm. And uh, I um, teach courses in instructional design. I also co-teach a class on learning space design. And mm. I got involved in the Flex Space project of two or three years ago. Uh, uh, at a meeting at an ELI conference, Educause Learning Initiative conference, and I met, I had the pleasure of meeting Lisa Stevens, uh, and I was uh, working with Jerry Hanley from the California State University Chancellor's mm -hmm. Office, and I was helping, at that time, helping um, the Cal State campuses start uploading more spaces to FlexSpace, and so that was my first 
uh, dip of my toes into the flex space pool. And now to use your term, Brian, I am now the cat herder of the flex Mm -hmm. space initiative. So Uh, I do user outreach, user support. Um, I do partner outreach as well as work with the core team uh, to bring us together to continue to improve the interface uh, and really make sure that we're listening to the users uh, and meeting the needs and continuously evolving the flex space portal. That's a lot to do. Um, well, <laughs> welcome. And, thank and, and Lisa, tell us about yourself. Oh, I'm very happy to be the Assistant Dean for Digital Education at the University of Buffalo School for Engineering, where I am charged with helping our faculty uh, make their offerings available online through a variety of ways and uh, exploring more hybrid learning. And I'm also still serving with one foot in SUNY system administration as a senior strategist for academic innovation. And I have the pleasure of working with the Open SUNY team and a number of people throughout the state of New York. And that's also afforded me the opportunity to travel around the country quite a bit. So Mm. FlexSpace uh, evolved uh, initially out of SUNY as a task group in learning. It was called the Learning Environments Task Group. And Joe Moreau, who's now vice chancellor at Foothill De Anza, uh, was was one of the co-founders, one of the leaders of this initiative. We had a number of schools uh, kick in and and participate in this project. And it all began when our SUNY system level provost, remember, this is a 64 campus system. It's a very large system walked into an advisory group and said, you know, we are spending millions and millions of dollars on built learning environments, and I'm not exactly convinced that we have the right people around the table. And Mm. he charged our our group with coming up with a solution, some way to just share information across the SUNY system. Now, it seems like a long, long time ago, (laughs) but we only had things like Flickr, uh, Phil Wong was using Flickr to to archive a number of, of spaces and Facebook. And we thought, well, golly, nobody wants to be sitting in their office and have ads pushed to them. So we need to find a platform that's easily adaptable and can, can um, compile and warehouse not just high resolution photos of rooms, but something that can also deliver video and something that can be connected to very detailed attributes and a taxonomy that describes those spaces. And that's how we got our start. And then from there, we went off to a a conference and presented our very earliest of findings and a number of people in the room at the Consortium of Colleges and University Media Centers raised their hand and said, we're interested in this. We, we'd kind of like to, we'd like to play in this space with you. And from there, we went to the new medium media consortium and ELI. And gosh, I could just talk about our story for a long time, but I'm sure it's far more interesting to, to ask Rebecca to show what we're up to. And thank you for your long encouragement and support, Brian. You were one of the people early on, along with Phil and a number of other people who said, keep going. This is, this is important work. Keep going. Uh, it is important work, and, and you're doing a great, great service. And I think Phil Long should be in on the, the video conference right now. Um, so just bef- before we go, I, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to put up a, a quick video um, that uh, Rebecca and Lisa's team have put together about FlexSpace. And um, let's, just, let's just try this. Let's see if we can watch this here in Shindig. Um, so Tara, do you want to cue the video? You should open as a new pod. There we go. So what is FlexSpace? The Flexible Learning Environments Exchange is the one-stop open resource for best practices, detailed examples, and a community dedicated to improving learning spaces around the world. Whether you're a novice or industry expert, FlexSpace makes it easy to create, collaborate, and share learning space examples and resources. The FlexSpace collection provides a mobile-friendly and highly searchable database 
use of detailed learning examples contributed by practitioners and educators in higher ed, K-12, libraries, and museums. It's not just a collection of active learning classrooms. FlexSpace contains all kinds of learning spaces, including maker spaces, STEM labs, group study and meeting rooms, general classrooms, large auditoriums, learning commons, and even transitional and outdoor spaces. The FlexSpace community connects you with others who are focused on campus planning, educational technology, AV systems integration, instructional design, teaching, and research. How can FlexSpace help you? FlexSpace can help you streamline and prioritize projects, drive the conversation with stakeholders, inform the planning process, and showcase your work. Use FlexSpace to take a virtual trip and browse hundreds of learning space designs and curated galleries from around the world. Take a closer look by searching and filtering to find learning spaces that match your specific needs with photos, floor plans, case studies, and details about technology, furnishings, and more. Use the toolkit to find best practices, research, white papers, planning guides, evaluation instruments, and instructor support resources. Use idea boards to collect and share your favorites with your project team, campus stakeholders, or other partners. Tap into the community directory or discussion forum to get advice from experts and experienced practitioners. And of course, you can publish your own campus spaces from a mobile or desktop device using the new easy-to-use template. You might upload exemplars to showcase your best work or document and inventory all of your campus learning spaces to create a campus repository. You might even upload before and after spaces while a project is underway. So, what are you waiting for? Visit FlexSpace.org and start exploring today. Nicely done. Nicely done. And that sketches out a whole range of functions in just a couple of minutes. Um, just a, at a meta level, by the way, I think this is the first time in the Future Trends Forum that we've shown a video within the Shindig space. Um, so I'm just very pleased that, that, that that's worked out well. Um, and I have friends, I'm to give a shout out to my um, intern from our San Diego State Learning Design and Technology program who created the video uh, this summer but as he was helping work on the FlexSpace project. So, Elliot Page, thank you very much. <laughs> Indeed. Well done, Elliot. Well done, Elliot. Um, now, speaking of bringing other people, uh, friends, usually I begin the forum by asking a bunch of questions uh, of our poor guests. Um, and then what happens gradually is that more of you will have your questions and comments. And sometimes it takes a few minutes and they'll filter in. But before I even get to ask my first question, uh, Fred Bashir's already has a question, which is fantastic. So let's pull him up on stage if his video is working. Uh, Fred is... Uh, Longtime friend of the program and is uh, retired from Berkeley, and he has a lot of great ideas. Fred, can we uh, hear and see you? Let's give a second for the connectivity to work. So this is the other end of California, I'm afraid, Rebecca. North of Rebecca. Yeah. Let's see if this can come across. You may be having a connection issue. Um, so if we can't get Fred up, uh, Fred, if you can't, um, if you can't reach us, uh, please type in your question um, on the uh, ask button, and we'll flash it on the screen and read it out loud. Um, I do see Phil. Yeah. Oh, good. I saw Phil. There's almost a hundred people uh, in right now, um, but if uh, Tara, if you have if you have Fred's uh, text, why don't you flash up on the screen? So here's the question he wanted to ask: Has your taxonomy to describe learning spaces been standardized, i.e., e.g., by IMS? Consider the IMS learning design spec. Oh, really good question, Fred. Um, I can. I can speak a bit to how the taxonomies evolved. Um, a shout out initially to our AV um, constituent group who worked within a group for quite a while to develop an exhaustive list of technologies that were contained in most typical learning classrooms. And then we added, um, we worked with SCUP to ask how we could design the attributes around the architecture and the spaces. And then from there, we, we narrowed into the learning uh, 
the learning taxonomy, where we worked with a number of instructional designers, a number of academic technologists. And that part, we really worked around the country. Dana Giodarski helped us with that quite a bit. And the taxonomies became so large that we actually had to pare them down because one of the early questions became, we want this to be very useful to people. And we worked with librarians, and the librarians got so detailed that it was wonderful to pull information out. Um, but it took an awful long time to populate the records. So where do you find the balance uh, for how much time to spend populating the record versus you know, going in and, and using um, you know, what we hope would be a fairly pragmatic tool in a number of ways? All that said, it's been revised twice. Rebecca, you can talk about the focus groups that you ran. And yes, I think that's a terrific suggestion. Mm -hmm. Oh, and the yes. learning space yes. rating system as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so in the, um, if you're not familiar with the um, evolution of FlexSpace, we have what we're calling the old portal and the new FlexSpace 2.0 portal. And so, mm. um, the original portal was up, and as Lisa said, before I even came on the project, there had been um, the committees that came up with the different taxonomies. And then when we redesigned the interface, we just went and revisited those, you know, pulling a lot of what we had from the original and then revisiting that with the focus groups with our core team of advisors. Um, and uh, Adam Finkelstein was on that, Phil Long, Malcolm Brown, Tara Jodowski. Um, I see Christopher Johnson um, on here as well when we started making a more relationship with the K-12 environment uh, and community. Um, we wanted to make sure we have a K-12 voice um, in it to see. And so we're, we're evolving um, in line as we're creating the new interface. We are constantly revisiting that taxonomy. And so right now we've also um, had somebody suggest do we have tags for um, elements of universal design, you know, and can we put those kinds of tags in there? So um, if any of you are interested in being involved in that conversation on maybe how the taxonomy um, needs to evolve, um, please let us know after this and um, we'll be in touch with you to be part of that discussion. I think if you click on that little widget that says more about flex space, there's a miniature um, set of, of slides, and that also has Mark Lee's uh, contact information. Mark has very graciously uh, agreed to lead the research effort around FlexSpace. It was wonderful that researchers came to us and said, please let us dive into what we hope will be uh, robust analytics coming out of the portal and we look forward to working with them more closely as a community in one of our many sub-communities of practice. Well, what kind of research will you be doing, Lisa? Do, do you want me to take that? <laughs> yes, please, um, to, date, to date, it's been mostly trend analysis in terms of mm -hmm. who's been going in and looking the types of spaces. Um, the different types of spaces that have been uploaded, but we hope, um, and, and I'm sure when Rebecca uh, demos the platform or does the screen share, um, one of the big messages that we hope everyone will take away is that the, the FlexSpace version one portal was not mobile. It was a little more challenging to use. And what we heard loudly from our community was, gee, we want to be able to walk into a classroom with a mobile device, capture the essence of the room, and then start tagging and building out the attributes that are in that record. So when we streamlined, streamlined to the new version 2, which is a custom portal, um, we hope that that is going to afford us a lot of opportunity to get much more robust analytics out of the portal and be able to also develop into the portal some research tools. In addition to just from a community of practice perspective, in our toolkit, we can share a variety of research instruments. We hope that that community will contribute um, 
good good mm. questions for surveys, good research protocol for focus groups, things of that nature. So we can start to hone in a little bit on some common data terms, some common data sets that will assist with learning design in general. Oh my gosh, this is very powerful. Uh, let me just quickly ask three basic kindergarten level questions if I could. Uh, first is roughly how many documents are hosted in Flexspace now? So right now we have um, probably about 400 unique learning spaces in Flexspace. Mm -hmm. And as a reminder, um, again, we this is created by educators for educators. So this is your tool. This is your free open access tool that you can contribute your learning space examples. So we have seen the contributions growing since the new portal um, and the, mm -hmm. the template has been rolled out. And then we're doing a phased rollout. So first and foremost, it was the ability to upload spaces. And then the, the features that Lisa is talking about, um, the toolkit, that's under development right now, even as we speak. Um, and we're hoping to see some glimpses of that um, at Educause in a few weeks. Uh, so right now we don't have those resources uploaded into the, you know, those kinds of resources uploaded yet as far as toolkit resources. We have, in terms of documents, like you said, almost 400 learning spaces. Um, and the membership, we have about probably 3,500 unique individuals who have Flexspace accounts. And that is uh, representing about 1,200 unique educational institutions. Oh. Say that again. So, how, how many of those? How many of those unique accounts? I think it's about 3,400, 3,500. Wow! Wow! From 54 countries. Wow! Wow! That's fantastic. So it's pretty exciting. Pretty exciting to see the growth. Yeah. Absolutely. And it just. And speaking of growth, just one last quick basic question. What year did Flexspace open its doors? About five years ago, Lisa, is that right? The task group itself was launched in 2011. Uh, we mm -hmm. spent somewhere in the neighborhood of a year doing research and finding a good fit for a portal. Um, in the widget, there is a nice uh, uh, graphic that describes that over time. So we started with beta and spent another year working with our colleagues across the country. Back to the earlier point of how did you develop the taxonomies and make your choices. We worked with a broad range of constituent groups from ELI, uh, had some friends from the NMC, and uh, trying to think who... Who else? There were just people scattered around the country from a variety of places. Um, so I, I believe that version one was released somewhere around late 2012, early 2013. So in just really, you know, we're talking about five years. Um, you've gone from zero to thousands of people, uh, hundreds and hundreds of learning spaces and a larger number than that of documents. I'm, Bravo. We had to, um, we, Rebecca, Rebecca had to go in and clean out uh, a lot of the test records. We had a lot of pictures of people's cats <laughs> and uh, all sorts of interesting kick the tires type of data. So those are real learning spaces that are in there at this time. Excellent. Um, before I go further, we had another video question. Uh, Stephen Charles Ehrman would like to come up. So let's see if we can bring him up. This is always the, the test. Uh, mentally, I always think of a Star Trek transporter sound at this point. Oh, yes. Hello. Hi, Steve. Hi. How are you doing? Uh, I was curious about sustaining um, Flexspace. Good question. Uh, you know, there have been plenty of databases that, as they grew bigger and older, uh, and as the initial enthusiasm of the founders uh, began to shift inevitably to maybe some other things, um, they just fell into this use and then, and then disappeared, which might not be a problem. Well, I was wondering what your thoughts were on sustaining Flexspace. Um, I'm happy to respond to that. Rebecca, are you gonna pull up the uh, 
Okay. Um, good question. So glad you asked. And we agreed that we were concerned about long-term sustainability. And ain't nothing for free. <laughs> so how, do you, how can you possibly fund a custom portal? Uh, we, we have done this through a lot of in-kind support from SUNY in terms of my time and the time of a number of people from our campuses to get it off the ground. We also received early support from the Consortium of Colleges and University Media Centers that picked up the initial hosting costs of our version one. And then we began to make friends from some, some corporations that saw the value in being able to communicate and to share some of their new um, innovations in teaching and learning technologies. So we have a relationship with a number of corporate partners, most notably Herman Miller, which was very generous, generous in helping us to get off at the ground floor. And uh, the SUNY system and the California State University system has also been very generous in helping. So we are seeking more support. We have recently, with this new version two portal, have interest from some very large research foundations, and we hope to be pursuing some conversations with them, particularly around the learning design research component, as you might well imagine, and universal design and the like. Um, but there is an avenue there for everyone. Uh, there's also a uh, potential for value add services that Rebecca will show in a minute. In addition to the large free and open collection, we think of ourselves as an extension of a B2B OER style service, but um, it's, we're getting a lot of interest from individual campuses that are very interested in using Flexbase to wall off some of their own campus collection. In that case, we think it's very reasonable to ask those campuses to contribute, you know, to the maintenance of the portal. And uh, so far, the trajectory is promising. Um, we're not quite over the development hump yet. Um, mm. We hope that after we get through this next development phase, the, the current development phase, we'll probably look at one more development sprint and then it's all just a matter of responding to the needs of the community. And one last thought is we certainly hope to be going down the path of some exciting developments in that third sprint, which would include things like virtual reality, uh, using some more of the tools that real estate agents seem to use with ease. <laughs> so you can actually fly into a room and look at various details. But right now, mm -hmm. we just want to get the core services in the galleries, the, the collaboration tools, the things that, that will ensure sustainability with the focus on the pedagogy. Great question. Great question, Stephen. Um, and thank you for that rich answer, especially with that emphasis on pedagogy, on teaching and learning. Um, we have, um, friends, you get the sense um, already of, of how this can work. If you haven't done this before, of how we were able to beam Steve up on the stage so you could ask questions of people. Um, any of you can do this as well. We have a text question that came in from Ian Douglas, uh, who gives a bit of historical framework. He writes, a few years back, I attended an Educause event detailing problems in the new learning space. At the end, several people who had designed new spaces highlighted the problem of new space which is old teaching. Have you established a best practice for transitioning instructors to the new spaces? Great question, Ian. Yeah, so um, I'll jump in on that one. We have not established those best practices or leading practices, but with this new portal, we absolutely want to, we see FlexSpace as being this one-stop hub for a community of practice and then we are the platform to be able to disseminate those leading practices and maybe even recommended um, instructional strategies and practices and so forth and so we are really seeing a lot of momentum with our um, advisors as we've talked about and anybody that you know reach out to us if you would like to be part of this team to really curate resources um, and that's part of what mark lee's research group uh, I think they had a they have a subcommittee that's looking at 
um, you know, specific design patterns and things for what is what what are the elements that need to be in an effective space, but then what are the pedagogies and the effective practices um, to support that? Um, and so we look forward to being this hub, like I said, to disseminate those types of resources to faculty. And we heard um, early on too from, uh, we were talking with Julie Johnson and um, Tracy Birdwell at Indiana University and their mosaic project that really um, one large element of that is to support faculty that are teaching in active learning classrooms. And Tracy made the point that there are communities sort of walled off within a university, within their own campus. Maybe it's, um, you know, a handful, a dozen or more faculty members at a campus who are teaching in the active learning classrooms and they're kind of forming their own small community of practice. But there wasn't really an easy way to talk to um, faculty members across the country at different campuses mm -hmm. and bring the mm -hmm. resources together. So we're hoping to also, um, you know, provide that platform for faculty um, to use FlexSpace, um, you know, for the to uh, come together in those discussions and then curate those kind of resources so that we can provide them in sort of a curated gallery, you know, on on FlexSpace. Mm. Curated gallery. Hey, Rebecca, great... Do you do you have the do you have the feed of what the toolkit and gallery looks like on the the path handy? I don't want to put you on the spot if you don't have it handy. But I think what a number of I think what a number have... of us have Go ahead. I was just gonna ask a technical question. Can I should I bring up the screen share? at the same time we're talking and I did just bring up a screen share and I don't know if, if we saw that or not, I was showing the partners, but I can absolutely bring up um, sort of a walkthrough demo. Um, what format is it? Is it a video? Is it a, a PDF or what? Um, I would do a screen share of my browser and then I would click through the portal. And then um, the other thing is uh, the live portal. And then I have a tab that's the prototype it really is pages of PDF files that I would click through. Um, uh, Tara, is this, is this something we can we can do now, or should we uh, or should we try another approach? Let's, well, let's try this. Do let's let's do this. Okay. Um, Rebecca, so you have instructions. The, mm -hmm. I think I can. I'll do that. Okay, here we go. You tell me, why don't you give me some audio feedback when you say, yes, I can see the, the screen because I won't see you all when I'm sharing my screen, so. Very good. So many of us have started our own personal collections of teaching methods for active learning classrooms. I have a couple of sheets of exercises, you know, think, pair, share types of exercises. And, you know, the opportunity to share that into a toolkit and get ideas exchanged with colleagues all over the world is really powerful. I can see that. I can definitely see that. Uh, Rebecca, I'm not seeing anything up yet. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm going to... Um, actually, do we have screenshots in the... Uh, no, I'll just go ahead and show the prototype. Let's see. There we go. Sharing screen. So right now, Rebecca, you, you had a uh, screen sharing logo superimposed over you. And now, in place of you, we have the website, I believe. Okay, That great. is the website. Yeah, so this should be the prototype with all the menus at the top. Um, and so <clears throat> this is right now in the real active uh, live site, we have spaces. That's the, the one main button that you'll see. This is the prototype of where we're going, what we're building out. Rebecca, what we're seeing is a uh, screen share of our main website. Okay. Um, I have a different tab open, so let me just go back. Maybe I have to pick the specific tab. Now I do see that. Okay. Yeah. It's a nice site, very clean. 
this looks like the page potentially that Tara might be showing because I don't have that page up on my computer. Okay, well, right now we're, we're looking at um, the main page, which has a blog post, I think, at the top um, about uh, this meeting right now. Um, yeah. But uh, right now, what you are looking at is what we are looking at, apparently. And I think your screen sharing is pausing right now. Page, so that's what's kind of odd. Um, let me... Yep. Well, tell you what, we have uh, another video question from uh, Michael Goodsvard. Why don't we bring Michael up, um, and he can ask us questions. And, uh, and uh, Becca, you can uh, try this again um, and see what you can pull up. Okay, here comes Mike. Hello. Hello, Dartmouth. Hi. Hi, Lisa, Rebecca. Nice to see you all this afternoon. Great to see you. Um, so it's I've, I've watched Flex Space uh, develop over the last couple of years and really excited about its capabilities. I'm thinking about the other sort of information and data that relates to classrooms and learning spaces. So if I talk to my facilities colleagues, they're interested in mm. sort of the condition mm. and uh, refresh rates. Um, if I talk to the registrar, they're interested in sort of utilization and availability. Um, the user of a classroom might be interested in sort of some mix of this information. So I'm wondering uh, if you see down the road any sort of blending of these environments so you could sort of one-stop shop look for a room that's available do a quick virtual tour and book it all in one space uh, while rebecca's putting that up i'll go ahead and respond it's nice to see you again but in essence um you've hit on what we think is kind of the genius of what evolved which is taking those three different primary stakeholder groups and getting everyone to understand through the lens of the other's experience. I affectionately often call it the team of rivals. And it's, mm -hmm. it's the opportunity to tie to a single record. So the faculty member who is frustrated um, with either technology or the design of a space can effectively communicate in the planning stages uh, with the facilities, people and the architects, and of course with the AVIT integrators. And the concept behind that is with our toolkit, and we are, by the way, Rebecca, seeing everything I think as we should now, um, but the concept on this next development piece is to organize the content into both idea spaces, idea boards. Think of it as Pinterest type of boards where different different groups can collaborate either across those stakeholder groups or within those stakeholder groups to reach various levels of consensus. Um, and then we also have uh, the space that's organized for the toolkits and of course the gallery spaces that can be tagged and organized and curated in particular ways. And we couldn't have timed this any better because Rebecca it looks like she's now able to share what these actually look like. And, and we'll be interested in hearing your feedback in that refinement stage over the next, I would say the next few weeks. We, we hope some of this will be ready for our workshop at EDUCAUSE. That was Let's a shameless a plug. It wasn't even intentional. No, that's the, there's no shame and there's no, no blame in this. Uh, yeah. So okay, thank uh, we're you. Right now, I'll be there. Oh, looking forward to it, Mike. Yeah. Um, so right now we're looking at Buffalo State um, in uh, the SUNY system, and we get to see their, um, their page, which has uh, a series of members. And uh, Lisa, do you want to do you want to talk us through this a bit? I can. What Rebecca is showing right now is the community portion of this. We we laugh a little bit that even at the R1 institution, sometimes we don't know what everybody's working on. So it's a nice way to be aware of who on your campus is actually involved in learning space design or within a particular collaboration at any one time. Rebecca, I don't know if you can speak uh, while you're doing this. And if not, just go ahead and go to different elements and I'll be happy to provide your voiceover. Or can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. 
So what you're looking at is the prototype. So this is not really people from Buffalo State, and nor do I think this is a picture of Buffalo State. Um, this is so these are right now these are clickable PDFs, and, and I'm showing you the prototype. So the idea okay. here is that if, when you upload your space to uh, to FlexSpace, it automatically associates you it, with your email domain from your school um, and then it, your institution. And then every space that you upload is associated with that institution, which then automatically goes mm -hmm. onto your institution page. So mm -hmm. you don't have to create an institution page. And the idea is that you can go, um, you know, as an internal resource or to see what people are doing at, at another particular institution that you're interested in. You can see everybody who has a FlexSpace account at your institution, at that institution, and then all of the spaces at that institution. Um, and all of the toolkit resources at that institution. So this is what's under development right now. Um, these sort of gallery um, or pages for an institution. Um, and then this way you could click and um, get more information about that particular person um, and uh, communicate with them directly. And then uh, the spaces is live uh, right now. So this is the prototype, but um, the I can take you to the, the live site, which is, uh, let's see, I'll go here. So we get to so see you type in your login credentials. That's right. This, well, actually, this is a, um, this is a uh, shareable user uh, uh, account here, but you can go to flexspace.org, mm can create your own account uh, and you can get in here. Every Everybody should have their own individual account. You shouldn't have just one for your institution. Everyone should have their own. Um, and so this is the live site. So you could see when I showed the, the portal, the prototype, I'm sorry, it had spaces, community, institutions, toolkit, and so forth. Those are the pieces that are being built. Right now, spaces is live. It's fully searchable. Um, mm. And so... So uh, all of the tags, all of the descriptions and so forth. And then you can like spaces. Um, and this is really exciting, Lisa. You probably haven't logged on um, this week, as, uh, but you can see there are all these new spaces that have just been recently uploaded. You can sort by, um, you know, uh, the date that the record was uploaded or the date that the, um, the space was built or last improved. You can search on different types or filter on different types of spaces, uh, different types of seating capacity. So some of these features we determined through the user research that we would make some of these um, details required to publish the space so that they feed into the filters. Um, and you can see different types of institutions yeah. and so forth. Yeah. This is very rich. That's this really isn't just helpful. searching. There's a lot of breakdown, a lot of... Uh, a lot of ontology here. That's really good. We tried to add a lot to make the peer benchmarking as um, easy as possible. So if I'm at a community college, I can easily look through community colleges. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very nice. And another great feature, and I'm sorry, I wasn't tuned into the question about different, you know, people from facilities, it sounded like, or different, you know, different perspectives. Mm -hmm. One of the great mm -hmm. features about the new FlexSpace portal is that uh, you can, for instance, Aurora at San Diego State started, it created this record. Maybe you're out in the room and you snap a photo with your, your mobile device, whatever it may be. Right. You create right. a record and she's uploaded photos, um, tag, put tags on what's in the space, um, and then added additional photos. But now she can go back to her team and edit this space and add collaborators. Oh, and you know what? I'm sorry. I, I didn't get to demonstrate that right there um, because okay. I'm not logged in. Uh, but if I, let's see, if I go to the space, I can add collaborators. So that means adding co-editors basically to this space. So I could add mm. um, right here, add collaborators. So I could add, let's say faculty, a faculty member who teaches in this space. So then they can come in and write up their description on the kinds of instructional strategies they're using in the space. Um, nice. you know, what Maybe stories of um, learning outcomes and impact. Um, you can yeah. have the facility 
person as a collaborator. They can add more detail about the facilities. You can add the, the technology folks and so forth. So you can go in here and basically just, and this is live on the live site, but I couldn't do it on that record in particular, but I can search the FlexSpace mm -hmm. database by email and then find somebody, add them as a collaborator. And so you really can um, get a lot more uh, different perspectives when you're describing the space and get that rich detail. Let me, let me pause you for a second, Rebecca, because there's some questions that have been stacking up. And I just want to say that I'm glad what you showed us, because reaching back to Ian's question, uh, you just gave us one way for connecting new learning spaces to instructors. Uh, so they can share their observations, their questions, and do that with peers. And then answering Mike's question, you just showed us how easy it is to bring multiple people from multiple domains, architects, maintenance, facilities, uh, registrar, faculty, students. Uh, that's brilliant. Uh, we have a video question that's come up uh, from a mutual friend and a longtime friend of the forum and a previous guest, uh, Phil Long. Uh, so, Tara, why don't, we, uh, why don't we bring Phil up on stage? And thank you again, Rebecca, for taking us through both the live site and also the prototypes. Yeah. Well, Phil, where are you today? I'm in Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, being a Charlottonian. <laughs> of course you are. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. And I just wanted to say um, how pleased I am to see both Rebecca and Lisa presenting this after so much time and energy has gone into it. Um, because it's been a, a lot of effort, and uh, I think they don't get enough credit for, for sustaining something which is difficult to sustain over time. Here, here. Um, so the question was actually prompted by Mike's comment about um, uh, who, who his facilities folks, and, and it reminded me the, of the fact that people looking at an environment like this are going to look at it from the eyes that they bring to it, and that's a real challenge for the developer side of it in terms of uh, if you're really going to build this out to be useful for the facilities people, there's probably stuff that they would need and want, which would resonate with them and, and not many other people. <laughs> Similarly, if you're looking at it from the faculty side, uh, there are things that you'd want to see about it. But um, I think they carefully stayed away from suggesting pedagogical usage of the space lay instead an ecological sort of framework to say, here's what's out there and here are the, some of its attributes. And then prompting, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to get on stage, prompting everybody watching to think about how you would use it and articulate, well, so how do you take advantage of something like this as a catalyst to describe a fact that the utilization of a particular set of features um, and propose that? And what would this site need in order to just be a little bit more helpful? in that particular dimension, because they can't, you know, it's it's a floor wax, it's a dessert topping, and, and after a while it becomes a little bit of everything and, do, and does nothing. So we have to be very careful about making sure that it is as useful as possible, and this audience is a great audience to help them solicit the kinds of ideas that need to be in the mix for they consider the next rate, rate, uh, set of development activity. Well, that's a great prompt, Phil. That's a great prompt. Um, and if, uh, friends, if, if you don't know Phil, there are many reasons to know him. And one is that for more than a decade, he's been one of the pioneers in uh, new learning spaces uh, around the world. Um, so let me, let me just, if I could uh, take up your uh, charge, Phil, and ask people, what, uh, what would the rest of you like to see? Um, there's uh, 71 plus people right now involved. Uh, you've just been uh, taken through a quick demo of the site from Rebecca. You've uh, heard about how the site functions. Some or all of you work in new learning space designs. This is the time to ask, what kind of stuff would you like to see in this? Uh, might give you one hint on the idea of having multiple populations represented. Um, and then... Uh, Steve Ehrman gave us perhaps another hint, which is how to make sure all this is paid for, which is great. What else would you like to say? And that may be, while you're thinking of this, while everybody is, is, is scratching their heads, brainstorming, whipping out their uh, blue sky pads, um, let, me, let me ask both of you, Rebecca and Lisa, where do you see, you know, future, looking ahead to the future a bit, where do you see some of the new learning spaces beginning to change and develop? If you're looking out to say, you know, 2022 or so, based on everything you've seen on this site, the 400 plus examples, 
What are some of the trends that we should be paying attention to? I think that one of my favorite stories is not around all of the sexy technology, if you will, and the parameters of what we can do, especially as you start to look out with the AR, VR, XR tools. Mm -hmm. my, my favorite question was from someone that was from a very um, not resource rich uh, part of the country talking about how much he valued this collection by figuring out how to do more with less and how to take a bit of a minimalist approach as the result of being able to see how to adapt different technologies and, and have them serve in multi-functions. For example, mm -hmm. um, rather than having expensive displays, it may be better for a K through 12 environment to have um, a whiteboard, a mobile whiteboard to take around the room. Um, so it's almost retro in a way. And we're out on the edge of trying to figure out, well, how does that impact learning? <laughs> so. Oh, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. Um, and that's a great prompt. You know, how do you do this on a budget? Um, I see it's all trying to say. Yeah, ahead, am, I, am I on? Is, is the audio coming yes. through? Yes, very uh, clearly. That's along those lines is it's also useful to think about this in a temporal context. And that is mm -hmm. where in the life cycle of the process of building spaces, using spaces, and or changing spaces, can something like this be helpful? Um, in one sense, it gives faculty a chance to begin to develop a vocabulary about how to talk about it. Uh, so in the early stages of thinking, it's a catalyst and a prompt to think about well, where do we actually want to do something on our campus based on what we're seeing out there? But later on, it's useful for sort of aligning the kinds of things that the interaction between the builder and the and the staff on campus that are managing the, the, the realization of that space can be useful for. And later after that, it can be used as a way of doing, uh, of providing a resource to um, the faculty engagement around the functionality of the space and where particular attributes can be brought into the teaching. And so, and so there's a temporal dimension to this that I think adds a different category of contribution. Yeah, and, and that goes back to, I forget, I think it was Mike who mentioned the refresh rate of, uh, of uh, hard materials, of hardware. We have a, a couple of quick comments that came up. Uh, Tara, if you can flash these up. Um, we have, um, one from Scott Johnson is I'm going to be interested in seeing effective use cases. We've got a room. Now we have to figure out how to use it. Good one, Scott. Uh, there's one more following. This. this is from Adam Finkelstein. He says, the real value here is the people and the community. The learning space community is amazing and very distributed. One of the most difficult things to do is to help bring people together. What plans do, and I think, you know, what plans do you have for that? Um, excellent, Adam. I agree. I agree. Same here in the forum. Uh, and we have one more. Uh, this is from uh, Gary Michael uh, Pavienko, Pavienko, I believe. The importance of studying the social, emotional health and well-being of users in the space, especially to the cognitive. Ah, excellent point, Gary. Excellent point. Um, and we had one that just came up in, in uh, the chat room that I'm in. Uh, this is from Willie Franklin. Uh, who says uh, they'd like to, they appreciate seeing a model of how to engage faculty in conversation with technologists about classroom design. And I pressed Willie on that, and, uh, and Willie said that a report would be good for that as a format. Um, they're looking for ideas on how to engage faculty. Uh, we're, uh, Phil, that's a great question. And I'm unsurprised, uh, not just based on your brilliance, but also your longtime work in this field. Um, but I'm, I, I think we have to pause on that moment because we are out of time. We are at the end of our hour. Uh, in just a rapid hour, uh, Rebecca and Lisa have taken us quickly through the history of FlexSpace, its functionality. You've shown us the future of FlexSpace. You've touched on where learning spaces could go. You've mobilized the forum community to give you feedback and ideas for where this could go next. Thank you so much. What a terrific pair of guests. Thank you. 
If I might, we really should give a shout out to our developer. Um, Xenial Digital has really uh, yeah. paved the path for a lot of the flexibility in this system, and we appreciate their help very much as well. And also, I would plug that if there's anybody out there that would like to get a quick demo or have a meeting with one of us, we're happy to set up a Zoom conference or whatever anyone would need to get a little more in-depth look at at the system. It was a little difficult to share all the attributes today. Well, that's because it's so it's so rich. You guys are doing an awful lot. Um, now, to uh, keep up with you, uh, obviously, flexspace.org is a, a great spot. Uh, you have um, your Twitter account, uh, which is flexspace.org on Twitter. Are those the best places to keep up with you both and with the project, or are there others we should know? I think that's the best. Um, and also, when you go to the flexspace.org website, there are user resources, so there's a new video as well that gives you an overview on creating a space and some tips to make a, a okay. great uh, space example. And uh, and also there's a link to a feedback form. So if you have requests or ideas, like you just asked, Brian, for people to share what you're interested in seeing, there's that feedback form that you can um, let us know that way as well. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I'm so glad to hear it. Thank you both again. Um, Thank please, you. everyone, stick around for, for just a minute. We have to explain where we're going for the next week. Um, but once again, thank you both. Uh, it's a great glimpse of a wonderful project that's looking at a major, major area. And if you all like, we can return to this topic in the future. Now, next week, we're returning to uh, one of our first guests, the awesome Rich DeMillo. Not just a professor of computer science, and not just a scholar who's written about the future of education very, very well, but he's also the leader of this fascinating program, where Georgia Tech has had an online master's degree in computer science, backed by MOOCs, which they did with uh, Udacity and with AT&T. So far, it's been really successful. This is a fascinating, fascinating project. A lot of future transform participants have demanded uh, a session on this, and now we've got it. So for next week, please join us so we can talk with Professor DeMillo and look at this really interesting project for online teaching and learning. Now also, uh, for next week, we're about to have the reading uh, schedule for our next book club reading. This is Zainab Tuvechki's Twitter and Tear Gas which is a great book about social media, mobile devices, and the politics of protest. I mean, I think this is one of the most immediate, germane books we could possibly be reading in 2018. So watch the book club um, website. You'll see uh, links uh, really soon. And get a copy from your library or from our bookstore. Uh, we'd be happy to uh, um, direct you to a Kindle or print copies of the book. Now, if that's not enough, if you'd like to keep talking about new learning spaces, online collaboration, how to involve multiple stakeholders and all that stuff and where it's all going, we have plenty of places for you to do this online. Uh, on Twitter, you can see uh, my handle here and the hashtag FTDE. We have discussion groups on Slack, LinkedIn, and Facebook. You can see the Shindig uh, social media handles here. We're all ready to talk and we're looking forward to your conversation. Uh, thank you all today so much for all of your great questions, for all your insights, and I'm looking forward to seeing you next time. Until then, take care. Bye-bye.